Whenever the government creates an expensive new program, the burden of proof for its necessity falls on that government. In other words, it is not the responsibility of the opposition to prove the program is unnecessary. It's the duty of the government to prove that it is necessary. What arguments have they made today to exhibit the necessity of this $35 billion bank? Most recently, the parliamentary secretary across the way has said that this bank is necessary to help pension funds earn a return. He points to the Canada pension plan, teachers' pension plans, other pension plans that invest in infrastructure in order to produce returns for future retirees. And he's right, they do. And they have, all around the world and right here at home. In fact, the, the Quebec case de dépôt is a large shareholder currently in the Canada line was the largest infrastructure project in British Columbian history, a large rapid transit train project funded one-third by private investors who were formed a consortium that included Quebec pensioners. Or Pension Fund Realty, which built a public transit station in Coquitlam with the money of its future pensioners because it, they wanted to bring more traffic to their shopping center. So they said, we'll build the station in our own shopping center, then the people getting out of the, the train and walking around will buy stuff from our tenants and we'll make more money. The Canada Pension Plan was at one time, and may still well be, the largest shareholder in the 401, 407 privately owned highway uh, in uh, the, uh, the greater Toronto area, an investment that produced for it very large dividends that supports the retirement of Canadian pensioners. So the member is right. Pension funds do buy in, and own and even manage infrastructure and do so well. And they've been doing it across Canada for many years, which begs the question, why do we need an infrastructure bank to have them do it? They're already doing it. So that can't be the reason for the bank. Second, they say, and they suggested in their budget document, there's $2 trillion of potential worldwide investment looking for projects. Global capitalists have money for projects, they say, and Canada has projects that need money. So let's connect the dots. But wait a second here. If the dilemma is that there's too much money in the world looking for infrastructure projects, how could the solution to that dilemma be another $35 billion of money? I thought the premise of the program was that there was already a lot of money out there, that we would not need taxpayers' money to build infrastructure because these global investors would build it for us with their money. So that can't be the reason either. So what is the reason? One need look at Division 18 of the Budget Implementation Act to find out. Because the overwhelming preponderance of money in the infrastructure bank will be delivered in the form of something called loan guarantees. Now, what are loan guarantees? I can tell you they are a fantastic instrument for the person being guaranteed. They mean that that person can make risky investments that could produce profits for him or her, but that if money is lost, the investor is guaranteed against those losses. Now, be careful. That doesn't take the risk out of the project. It takes the risk out of the hands of the person who invested in it. So where does it go? It didn't vanish. 
it's got to be somewhere. If, somebody, if, a, if a global investor builds a bridge and it goes over budget or has a revenue shortfall, that risk has materialized in serious losses. Somebody's got to pay for it. Who's holding the bag? Well, the answer is right there in the budget. Division 18, Clause 23, 35 billion Canadian tax dollars will backstop the losses of these international investors. So therein lies the real function of this bank, to backstop the profits of investors in large and sometimes risky infrastructure projects. That does violence to the basic free market principle that risk and reward go, to, go together. When you sever those two things, you have something called moral hazard. Moral hazard is when somebody is encouraged to take risky behavior because they can transfer that risk to somebody else. And that is exactly what this bank does. It is a gigantic insurance fund to backstop the profits of the wealthiest people on earth. The Prime Minister, and if anyone has any doubt about this, the Prime Minister got the idea for the establishment of this bank at Davos, a Congress of billionaires, from the head of the biggest asset managing firm in the world, BlackRock, which controls over a trillion dollars of wealth. He then met again with the same billionaire firm in New York, and then he allowed that firm to, con to organize an entire planning session for the establishment of the bank at the swanky Sh Shangri-La Hotel in Toronto, whereat his minister's own remarks were vetted by these billionaire pension fund and investment fund managers. After two years of consulting the billionaires on how they could use 35 billion tax dollars, he's allowing a parliamentary committee two hours to represent taxpayers. That's right. The billionaires who have everything to gain get two years of consultation. The taxpayers who have everything to lose get two hours of consultation. This is a growing phenomenon whereby powerful financial interests are increasingly looking for ways to put the risk of their investments on to the shoulders of taxpayers. There's something called there's something called rocking chair money. Money that comes to you as you sit back in your rocking chair. Used to be institutional investors would get it by buying government bonds. It was risk-free money. But bonds only pay two and a half percent now. They're too low. So these investors are looking for higher rates of risk-free return. And so they persuaded the Liberal government in Ontario to pay thousands of percentage points of markup in price on electricity for so-called wind and solar power electricity, which has bankrupted families and driven 60,000 people to food banks across the country, made Ontario the highest poverty rate in the entire, of any of the 10 provinces in the country, in order to backstop the profits of wealthy so-called green energy entrepreneurs. We see it with Bombardier, where instead of issuing new shares in order to raise money to pay for their cash sh shortfalls, the billionaire Bombardier Baudouin family protected its feudal privileges to control a majority of the company with a minority of the shares by getting money from Canadian taxpayers handed to them by Liberal governments in Quebec and here in Ottawa. We see this phenomenon spreading far, far and wide of crony capitalism that seeks to put the burden of risk on the shoulders of the hardworking middle class through government backstops while giving all the profit to the wealthy elite who can afford the lobbyists, the donations, and the influence to control the levers of government. The greatest concentration of wealth there is, of course, is government. And those with the most power to influence government always attempt to unlock that vault to their own benefit. And so today we stand in opposition to this naked attempt 
to undermine Canadian taxpayers by taking $35 billion from their hands and using it to backstop the profits of the wealthiest elite, and we reaffirm our commitment to true free enterprise on the side of those who work hard, pay their taxes, and play by the rules. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Here I thank the member for his speech, and I read it more as a lament for the decline into populism mm -hmm. and Trumpism of the Conservative Party. You know, the words like bil the billionaires. Well, when he says billionaires, what he really means is it could be the bus drivers union in Rio de Janeiro. It could be teachers in Alabama. It could be municipal employees in Alberta. These are pension funds. These are sources of capital. And yes, there is $2 trillion or maybe more of capital looking for returns to ensure the futures of those very people. And we can put that money to work right here in Canada, creating jobs, creating construction jobs, building strategic trade-enabling infrastructure, and having Canada be open for business so we can sell our grain, open our ports, and keep this country moving forward economically and in every other way. These used to be things conservatives used to talk about. They don't talk about them anymore. They just descend into buzzwords and snap phrases. And now here we have the evidence of the decline of, the, of conservatism in Canada. Mr. Speaker, I think it's a sad day. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, he says that he's doing, they're doing this for bus drivers and teachers. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, how many bus drivers and teachers were invited to the Shangri-La Hotel to talk with the Prime Minister about this $35 billion tax dollar corporate welfare bank that they're setting up? Was, were there any bus drivers there, Mr. Speaker? Or were there, were there simply those trying to, to harvest the biggest return with no risk to themselves whatsoever by offloading that risk onto taxpayers? Mr. Speaker, that is not populism. That is basic free market economics. You don't get rich by shuffling off your risk onto someone else. If you want to make an investment to earn a profit, that's great. We stand beside you. But we will not allow you to force other people to take the risk of that investment. Questions and comments? Mr. Commentaire? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government, House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, if I wasn't sitting in my place watching the member, I might have thought it was the leader of the interim NDP party that was speaking at times. I understand and I appreciate that the Conservatives have really lost touch with this particular issue. <clears throat> when you think about it, the member says, well, his problem is, is that the government is contributing to the bank. Well, by doing that, you're enabling other stakeholders such as, let's say, the city of Edmonton or the city of Calgary, some of those great western cities, to be able to, to look at it and say, maybe if we can get some assistance here, we can pool in some money. And yes, there might be a component for uh, a private investment. And as my colleague points out, much of that money that's going to go in there is going to be from pension funds. Some of those pension funds, if they weren't going to be invested, let's say, in this future bank, will in fact continue to leave the country of Canada. Many Canadians will uh, benefit by this investment bank, and the member needs to, to acknowledge that. But to say or try, try to imply that there is no role for government to play when it comes to leverage or leveraging additional private dollars in order to get a project up and going, I believe the member is wrong, and the, I would suggest the Conservative Party might want to rethink their position, because I would have thought they would have been supportive of a policy of this nature. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party does not believe in welfare for the wealthy. And that's exactly what this program is. This is designed to allow a private sector for-profit enterprise to come in and build something to profit, but in the event it all goes wrong, turn the risk all over to taxpayers. Now, we have no problem if somebody wants to come in and build something great and profit from it. 
In fact, we encourage it. We cut taxes for people like that. We remove red tape. Those are called entrepreneurs. But you know what entrepreneurs do? You know what they're known for? Taking risks. This is not entrepreneurship. This is corporate welfare. This is an attempt to take the risk off the ballot sheet, balance sheet of the wealthy interests who have control over this government and put that risk on the shoulders of Canadian taxpayers. And we will never stand for that. Well, Mr. Speaker, either the Prime Minister doesn't understand how his own bank works or he's afraid to come clean with Canadian taxpayers. The Liberals' own documents show that the bank works on the assumption that taxpayers will cover losses for private investors. So I want to ask the Prime Minister a very simple question. If the builder or the investor can't pay that loan back, as often happens, who gets stuck with the bill? I want to assure the honourable member and this House that the bank will only undertake projects that are in the public interest and will not invest in risky projects. And rigorous due diligence will be done by the bank, by the investors, by the municipalities, by the provinces, and the federal government experts that will run this bank will make sure that taxpayer dollars are always protected, that public interest at the forefront of decision making. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have the opposition. Mr. Speaker, if they're only going to pick projects that will never lose money, then why won't those private investors back them themselves? <laughs> logic is actually quite simple. Liberals will handpick projects and they'll handpick the investors. And they admit that the bank is all about de-risking projects for private investors. That means that investors get all the profit and taxpayers get all the risk. Can the Prime Minister explain to hard-working Canadians why he's asking them to co-sign loan for the richest 1%? Well, Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Pension Fund Investment Board, Omers, Teachers, Cassidy Depot, Alberta Investment Management Corporation, they all invest in foreign infrastructure, in international infrastructure. What is wrong, Mr. Speaker, if the same organization allow us work with our government to build the infrastructure that our Canadian communities need? For a decade, this government, the previous government, underfunded infrastructure for municipalities. Now we are catching up. We are making historic investment. We want to mobilize private capital to build more Order, order, order. Order. On the Infrastructure Bank Division 18 sub clause 22.2 of your budget bill says, and I quote, the Minister of Finance, on the recommendation of the designated minister, may make a loan or provide a loan guarantee with respect to the infrastructure project. If you loan, say, a billion dollars of taxpayers' money, to a company to build infrastructure, and that company goes bankrupt, who will repay Canadian taxpayers their billion dollars? Mr. Minister? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing up the uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank. We, uh, we believe that this institution will enable us to produce more infrastructure across this country than would be the case if we didn't put it in place. And who would repay the billion dollars? What we look towards doing is thinking about how we can attract additional money into infrastructure, projects that wouldn't otherwise get done. So the institution will be able to uh, use the $15 billion of uh, money we've put from our $180 billion over the next 10 years as well as use the uh, $20 billion in capital that the institution will have to make projects work. The specifics and the, the of lo each Loans would be an example of the capital. So the question was, if you loaned a billion dollars for an infrastructure project, who, and, that mu and, that, and the, le the borrower went bankrupt, as often happens, as happened to a builder in South End, Ottawa, who will repay taxpayers their billion dollars? I want to thank you for the additional clarity, but I did understand the question. 
The, uh, the, Nobody can understand getting, your answer because you're well, not giving one yet. I'd like to answer. I'd like to answer. So the uh, bank will be able to have specific projects that it supports in terms of concessional capital or in the terms of loans or loan guarantees. They're good examples. And who would repay it? The specific if, 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 a, if the builder Pierre, goes Pierre, bankrupt. Pierre, the, the I'm happy to answer your question if you'd like. The any any time, we're ready for it. If you have more to good. say, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, well, I, I will I'll move on to the, uh, the same clause in the budget bill. Gives you the power to offer loan guarantees for a company building infrastructure. That will make the taxpayer the guarantor of a loan. If a company gets a taxpayer guarantee for a billion dollar project and fails to repay that billion dollar loan, who will repay it? Floor is yours, Mr. Is it? Yes, it is. Are you ready for me to answer? Well, we've been waiting for you to answer for the duration, uh, so any time now. Who will repay the money? What I was uh, about to say was that in each project, there'll be specific situations. So in many cases, there'll be security behind that loan. So the security behind the loan would mean that if, in the case that you identified, that an organization wasn't able to repay the loan, the security would come back for the uh, federal government in that case. So uh, what I can't do is give you every specific project right now. But what I no, can but, do but is tell you, again, me, would minister. you like to answer the question or not? The question is who would repay it? The, the minister is answering your, your question. Give him time to answer it instead of interrupting. Wait, do you understand the concept of security behind a loan? I do. In fact, Chapter 2 of your budget it touches on that. Uh, it says that you will use subordinated debt. According to Investopedia, subordinated debt is more risky than unsubordinated debt. Subordinated debt is considered any type of lo loan that is repaid after other corporate debts and loans are repaid in the case of borrower default. That means that the debt owed to taxpayers would not be secured. The senior debt would be secured. So you're, you're, you're factually wrong. You're contradicting your own budget documents. It would not be secured. The well, actually, the, the, you're the, confused, so there, and you're inaccurate. You've so been, you've been, asked, like you've been answer, asked, you've been asked four times who would pay, pay back the taxpayer. So if a builder takes a billion-dollar loan from your taxpayer-backed infrastructure bank and goes bankrupt, who would repay taxpayers? A, no one, B, the tooth fairy, or C, would you take it out of your personal retirement funds? Who would repay taxpayers? So, uh, I'm Minister, we are going to give you time to answer that question, and your time's up, Mr. Polyev. Go ahead. I appreciate the opportunity to reply. So, the good uh, design that we've put in place for the Canada Infrastructure Bank would allow us to create an agency with expertise around how you can deliver on uh, complex financial arrangements to make sure that significant infrastructure projects actually get done. That would mean that what's required is not only seeking institutional investors, but considering the possibility of also finding ways to ensure that projects get done that might require loans, or in some cases, loan guarantees. We've given the bank flexibility to do that. Of course, we'll be relying on the expertise of this agency in order to make sure that they do this on commercially successful terms, as we do with other Canadian government uh, organizations like the Business Development Bank, like the Export Development Corporation that are very successful in terms of not only being able to provide loans, but being able to provide returns to the Canadian government through those loans. That's what we expect would happen in this case. We will be able to do more infrastructure through crowding in private sector investment. We'll be able to create structures that provide financing opportunities that allow us to get more done while creating better outcomes for Canadians, both through jobs and through long-term better infrastructure and a low level of financial risk. Mr. Albas, uh, slightly more than five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for you and your uh, deputies to be here today. Certainly appreciate your presence. Um, you know, I, I would like to just to touch on the infrastructure bank. Obviously, it's, it probably should be called an infrastructure corporation because it won't be providing banking services, uh, so to speak. But Minister, uh, just in context of this, right now I'm hearing from insurance companies that say the new OSFI's capital requirements on uh, 
for them to invest in Canadian infrastructure is going the opposite direction of the rhetoric of, of your government. Uh, they're saying that right now, that of, of January uh, 2018, that the new capital requirements actually make it more difficult for Canadian insurance companies uh, who have traditionally invested billions, uh, I think 70 billion in, in Canadian infrastructure. Can you explain why you are so gung-ho on an infrastructure bank uh, that basically is to attract foreign investment, while at the same time actually make it more difficult for Canadian companies to invest in Canadian infrastructure? Well, thank you for the question. I think this is actually a useful thing for us to talk about. Uh, the two things you're bringing up we see as entirely separate. So as we think about the uh, capital requirements for banks and for insurance companies, what we're thinking about in that regard is what are the requirements that those institutions need in order to protect the people that are, in the case of banks, putting their deposits with a bank, or in the case of insurance companies, people that are buying policies. The reason we expect capital requirements to be there is because we want to make sure that banks or insurance companies have the long-term sustainability that they need in order to pay out those depositors or those policy holders when the time is due. So that is the sole way that we're going to look at those capital requirements. With respect to the way those institutions decide to invest their money, uh, that will be based on those capital requirements that they have. So, That's the approach. Now, so this is, as when, to when the second part of your, your question, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is an entirely different body. This body is not a body for which there will be uh, depositors in that classic sense or policy holders. Instead, its goal is to increase the amount of infrastructure investment that goes on by using outside capital to come in on a project-by-project -project basis. So that outside capital, though, um, Minister, and this goes back to uh, Mr. Polyev's point earlier, is, is that uh, they won't be subject to the same rules about how much capital that they need to have in reserves. Is that correct? They won't be bound by the same rules uh, uh, that, uh, that we're going to be expected of insurance companies come January 2018. Uh, that is absolutely correct. There, we're and talking about two very separate, separate things. So an insurance company's capital requirements rules are based on the actual goal of that institution. And our goal as the prudential regulator of those institutions is thinking about protecting those people within it. The Canada Infrastructure Bank is actually looking to do something quite different. So if you can't, if you can't you know, make sure that there is uh, proper reserves for those companies that will be investing in these projects, Minister, what happens if a project goes bust? What happens uh, when the, uh, that money has to be paid back by, either through a loan guarantee through the government or, again, uh, through, uh, uh, you know, through the financing by the taxpayer? Won't, so, won't taxpayers end up being holding the bag then in that case, especially if they don't, if they're not regulated at the same level as Canadian insurance companies and banks? So again, this is a separate kind of institution. So the projects that we're talking about will be projects that investors will come in to invest in because they will see the business opportunity they, there. They'll see the business opportunity because there'll be an opportunity for perhaps their, their pensioners who could well be Canadians who are invested in the pension fund that those uh, opportunities will be there for those streams of income. If, so, for example, there was a, uh, a project in which uh, one particular investor, for some reason or another, didn't stay involved in that project, the continuing uh, business attributes of the investment would be there, meaning that it would still be yeah. possible for another investor to come but in again, and take But again, there'll their be position. two separate uh, forms of rules, one where the taxpayer ends up holding the bag, while the other one you have a very tightly regulated where there's capital put in place. And so I just disagree with, uh, with that kind of thinking, Minister. We should be encouraging uh, Canadians to be investing in Canada. Um, I'd like no, just you're, quickly you're move into excise duties. the nature of what we're trying to now, do here. Minister, just to are you aware that the, that the excise duties on wine have increased by 125% since 1980? And that the new measures that you're uh, proposing um, will basically be 2% uh, uh, per year uh, forever. Now, that's going to take a lot of investment out of wineries right across this great country, but also um, microbrewers and breweries and spirits. They are very, very subject to or sensitive to excise changes. Minister, have you done any work to see what, the, what that will do to the jobs and the, and the investment? Because this country right now, we are at the lowest levels of business investment since 1981. So, Minister, 
you know, have you done the homework when it comes to this particular sector and how sensitive it is, considering they pay all the other taxes? And by the way, excise ends up provincially as well as federally. Then you add the GST or HST, depending on where you're where, where you're making it. So, Minister, this is this, there's going to be increases right across the board. Have you done the homework? Let me come back to the first part of your comment to again say that the Canada Infrastructure Bank, on a project by project basis, will seek outside investors. And uh, that is exactly what we uh, hope to do in order to increase the amount of infrastructure investment that goes on in this country. Uh, the advantage will be that we will have uh, outside investors that will allow us to do more. And uh, that is entirely separate and distinct from banking or insurance company regulation. And uh, the two should not in any way be confused. With respect to uh, the uh, decision to uh, not allow excise tax to decline over time, uh, we've decided that what we will do is to ensure that uh, inflation, which occurs in our economy, as you may know, uh, will be able to be considered because the excise taxes will be subject to inflation like uh, other aspects of our economy are subject to inflation. So that, uh, we believe, is an approach that will uh, just be uh, long-term uh, positive in order to but provide Minister, predictability around uh, those excise taxes excise over time. Excise are ad valorem, so at the price and, of the wine Dan, goes we're, up we're substantially, uh, because of inflationary we're reasons, substantially it's going to over continue time, to do Dan, that. Dan, I, just, I just disagree Dan, with that, and we'll, I don't think we'll his department you, has done the homework, Mr. We'll Chairman. give you a, a, a minute later to follow that line of thought. Uh, before we leave the whole question around this infrastructure uh, outfit, I wanted to just get clarity on a comment you made to my colleague. Uh, if I heard you correctly, you indicated the uh, new infrastructure corporation would operate similar to the Export Development Corporation and Business Development Bank, which I believe are both 100% backstopped by the Canadian government. And if that's the case, and there are bad loans in those organizations, then it is in effect the taxpayer that would pick up that bad loan. And so then, is is that your answer to Mr. Polyev's question that if there's a bad loan within this? within this new infrastructure corporation, that it would, in fact, be the taxpayer that would pick it up. Mr. Minister. Well, thank you for the question and the opportunity to clarify. Uh, what I said was, was that this institution would be uh, finding ways to crowd in private sector capital. And among the ways that that might be done would be to consider loans and loan guarantees that might allow for projects that might otherwise not be economic to become economic. Uh, in the case of each specific project, we expect that the project would have dynamics that would entice uh, investors to be involved in that project, uh, which would mean that there was, uh, in many cases, security for uh, whatever it is that they might have had a loan or a loan guarantee for. So that's important. Uh, we do expect that in, in many cases that won't be necessary. In some it might. Each project will be uh, specific to that project. I expect that what will happen is that the uh, security that might be there might uh, create the opportunity for us to have uh, loans that work to make sure these projects are successful. Okay, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit. If my uh, colleague, Mr. Deltel, would, was here, he would ask one simple question. When are you going to balance the budget? <laughs> Mr. Minister. Uh, and if your colleague, Mr. Deltel, was here, I would want to spend time reminding him on how successful our efforts have been to uh, to deal with what we okay, saw so as a challenging environment when we came into office. Happily, uh, we are seeing a situation where employment has improved in this country, a very positive outcome, I'm sure, across the country, likely in all the ridings that we represent. I'd also okay, point out I, that I asked uh, one simple are question, when are you going to balance the budget, the and you, you haven't better. answered it, oh, so I, I want to go on to the next question. Okay, well, let's hear your next question. Okay, the next question is, uh, so I'm looking at uh, Division 2, Part 4, which uh, allows for the borrowing up to $1.3 trillion. Uh, Mr. Minister, if, I, uh, if my calculations are correct, during your four years as Finance Minister, uh, that uh, budget debt will increase to, by about $80 billion. You comfortable with that being your legacy? Mr. Minister. We are very much looking at a legacy of uh, creating success for Canadians and for Canadian families. Uh, we know that behind the uh, 250,000 new jobs over the last year uh, that we've created in this country are families that are now being more successful. We know that in each one of those situations, they're creating better economic outcomes. 
We know that to the extent that we can grow the economy more rapidly than it was growing when we came into office because of the lack of investment before, that we can actually find ourselves in a better long-term situation which will improve our uh, economy and as a result improve our fiscal health. Okay, just to be sure that the record is clear that uh, when this government took over almost two years ago, the budget was balanced. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, you talk about uh, legacy for Canadians. If my math is correct, I think when you're done as finance minister, every Canadian will have a legacy of something like uh, at least $17,000 per person owing. Again, are you comfortable with that legacy? Maybe we can be absolutely clear. When we came into office, what we saw were rosier than expected economic growth forecasts, which led to a conclusion that was erroneous, that we would be uh, successful fiscally over the next number of years. In fact, when we looked at the real outcome, the uh, growth was going to be lower, and therefore, uh, as you know, we have made investments to try and deal with that growth. What Canadians will see as a result of our investments, as a result of our uh, government over time is, as I said, more success for their families, a better situation for the long term, and uh, more positive growth in this country. That's not Quick correct, question, Minister. Quick Your response. own finance department released the numbers that said the budget was balanced at the end of that fiscal year. That's all I have, Mr. Mr. Minister. Mr. Minister, do you want to add further to that? Okay, then uh, nothing. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, after Order. misleading Canadians for weeks, the Liberals finally admitted yesterday that their infrastructure bank will put taxpayers on the hook for failed projects while the investors get all the profits. The Finance Minister claimed that there will be minimal risk to pack taxpayers. How reassuring. The Prime Minister also claimed that his deficits would be minimal too, but we all know how that turned out. So just how much taxpayer money is the Prime Minister willing to put on the line so that his billionaire friends get to keep all the profits? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians were very clear over the past years. They need investments in their communities, in public transit, uh, in green infrastructure, in uh, better housing, uh, the kinds of things that make our communities stronger and give growth and opportunities to people both right now and into the future. That's why we put together $180 billion of investments in infrastructure, uh, including a, uh, a brand new world-class infrastructure bank that will leverage private capital to deliver an even more of uh, the infrastructure that our communities and that Canadians need. We have an ambitious plan to build this country, and we know Canadians are with us. I will leader the opposition. The leverage comes from using taxpayers' money to guarantee profits for investors, and that's not right. The Prime Minister has to stop. Everyone understands that the infrastructure bank is going to help liberal cronies rack up profits without worry, worrying about any possible losses. Can he tell Canadians once and for all how much of their money he's willing to waste to line the pockets of his millionaire friends, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, for years Canadians have been saying that their communities need uh, infrastructure investment. The need is striking and that's why we set up an investment plan $180 billion over the years to come to create good jobs now and opportunities for Canadians for economic growth for the middle class in the future. The Infrastructure Bank is part of our ways of innovating to bring in more capital to create the infrastructure, the bridges, the public transit that Canadians need.